part of the mantle is called the lithosphere. So this white layer here is mantle, but it is much stronger than the mantle below it, and therefore works together with the continental and the oceanic crust to form this strong plate. So every time we talk about these plates, then we remember how we develop this idea of the strength versus depth. being like this. You have seen this picture many times now. And if you have a strength in this fashion, then you form plates. There is the top part of the earth which is stronger. And then within this lithosphere, okay, there are several other layers. There can be a sub-layer in the crust and so forth and so forth. But this major layering is really a first order, big, big property of the outside of the Earth. And this is what allows the plates to, be, to have their own identity and to move around. Now, the movement of the plates is driven by things that happen below them. The mantle is a very dynamic um, very dynamic part of the earth of course it is an enormous mass of rocks so from the center of the earth there is the, out, the inner core 1100 kilometers then there is another 2400 kilometer the outer core and then there is the mantle very very thick about 3000 kilometers thick and that the crust and the lithosphere are really quite a thin shell around it. And this mantle is undergoing convection, driven by its internal heat and also the remnant heat from the formation of the Earth. The most efficient way for the mantle to get rid of this heat is by convection. We will come back to convection in one of the uh, later lectures and I will explain to you the physics of convection. But basically, the reason why the mantle convex is because that is, for the mantle, the most efficient way to get rid of the internal heat. And the inside of the mantle is really a very complex place. We are learning more and more about it. Um, and this is one of the recent pictures where you can see that there are these plumes coming up, there are plates which are being subduct subducted and folded inside the mantle. Uh, and I think the, the, the main idea for you at this point to have from the mantle is that if you look at it at a very short time scale, it is a hard rock. So if you make a big earthquake, the earth starts ringing like a bell. The earthquakes go all across the planet. But if you wait for millions of years, the earth is like a bowl of soup. It is a very viscous fluid able to flow. And of course we have seen the equations at the basis of this uh, property. And this is what is uh, most difficult to grasp for many students. So. The mantle is a fluid, if you look at it, over the time scale of millions of years. But it is a solid, if you look at it, at the time scale of minutes. And nowadays we are able to understand this mental convection uh, in more and more detail. It is certainly not so that we can uh, model it uh, in all the details uh, that we would like to. But I took one of the recent models, I hope that it will work, um, on mental convection. So here you can see the boundary of the core. And these little things are convection cells rising up through the earth. And you can see how complicated 
this convection pattern is. It is a truly three-dimensional, very slow process. Um, but in many ways, it is similar to what is happening in a bowl of soup that you're cooking at home tonight. That's also a convection process. So, plate tectonics, mental convection, are really very, very big first-order things that we have to understand. And the other major thing which plays a role in tectonics is the meteorite impacts. If you look at the moon, which has cooled down a long, long time ago and froze, then we can see that its surface is full of craters, showing us that there have been a lot of impacts in the system around Earth and moon. But of course, our planet doesn't have as many craters. The reason being that plate tectonics has reworked and moved the craters down into the subduction zone. But on the other hand, there are craters on Earth, and there are quite a lot of them. Here is the most beautiful example. This is Meteor Crater, formed 50,000 years ago. In here is a house. This is the entrance of Meteor Crater, where there is a museum. And here, a 30-meter nickel iron meteorite fell on Earth about 50,000 years ago and made a huge explosion. There have been, of course, we know that now, much bigger of these meteorite impacts, which have really quite strongly influenced uh, the evolution of our planet. And the tectonics around impact craters is a story by itself. So... Plate tectonics and impact tectonics have truly reformed our way of, of looking at our, at our planet. So how do we know what is inside the Earth? Of course, um, we can't really drill very deep. You, maybe some of you have seen how difficult it is to drill a two and a half kilometer well here in Aachen. The deepest hole is about 10 kilometers and, of course, the Earth's center is much, much, much deeper than that. So the only direct kind of evidence that we have is from seismic waves going through the Earth. And in your geophysics lectures, you will see quite a lot of detail of this analysis where you can clearly see that one wave that goes through the Earth and come out here loses its shear wave component over a certain part of the receival side because the outer core is a liquid and the liquid cannot transmit shear waves. So we see all these discontinuities. We can determine the seismic velocity of all these different layers and from this we can make a first order model of how the layered structures of the inner Earth is composed and how it is structured. We know about the composition of the Earth and the information comes from strange places. Um, this table, a very famous table, uh, shows us the atomic abundances in the Sun and in meteorites. Of course, what is not plotted here in the sun is hydrogen and helium, because that is what uh, consists most of the sun. But the other elements in the meteorites um, and in the sun are quite comparable, showing us basically the initial chemical composition of the solar system before the planets were formed. So that is the starting point. And then the silicate earth, um, there are different ways of guessing what the average chemical composition of the earth is. First of all, you can look at this solar abundances, thinking that the earth is basically as a solar composition. So this is the first table. Then you look at... Um, Peridotites coming from very deep in kimberlite pipes. This is this composition 
Of course, here um, we only look at the silicate earth, not at the iron-rich core. And then this is a comatite melt, one of the very, very old melts that have formed uh, not very long after the formation of the earth. And you can see that you get a kind of general impression of the chemical composition of the earth. When we go down into the mantle, um, it is now generally accepted that there are very important phase changes. So, when we go about until 400 kilometers, the structure of the upper mantle is olivine, but when we go down, then the same chemical composition gets a different crystal structure because of the high pressure and temperature, and we get a spinel structure, and then even deeper, we get a perovskite structure. And this has first of all been measured using the acoustic waves, okay, so this is the wave velocity that we get from seismological information, but at the same time it can be compared with laboratory experiments. If you take olivine and subject it on to very, very high pressure and temperature, it will transform to spinel and perovskite, and then you can calculate or measure its acoustic velocity and so there are measurements with which you can compare the seismic velocities and so you can conclude that this is the phase structure of the Earth. So based on this, uh, seismologists have been able to make a kind of a reference model. A layered Earth with all the different layers having a kind of characteristic of standardized seismic velocity. And then if you know that, then you can look in more detail and find that locally the seismic velocity is different from this standard velocity. The method to do that is called seismic tomography and it has been a very, very important tool in tectonics over, developed over the last 25 years. Seismic tomography is very similar to uh, X-ray tomography, the CT scanning that you have seen in hospitals maybe, what they do is they look at arrival times of seismic waves from many, many earthquakes in many, many stations, and they invert this data to get a velocity structure of the Earth. And the plot here, and I'm going to show you many of these plots later in the course, this plot shows you 